So, um, it's even so late that we ran out of uh, moderators. So, uh, we're just going to do it ourselves. Have a right? conversation, yeah. Perfect. Um, so, I'm going to play the moderator first, um, Davis, and uh, thanks for being here. So, maybe you just introduce yourself and uh, what you're about, and then we kick off the conversation. Sure. So, the work we do is building innovation ecosystems across Africa, <clears throat> which is a really exciting time. If you look at, for example, VC in Africa, it's the only region that still saw some 35% growth last year, compared with every other region in the world um, suffering significantly. And so we're really, really, we are really interested in building these extensive ecosystems. And one of them is around space. Um, there's a lot of work happening in the space sector across Africa. There's a lot of history that people aren't aware of. And so we are exploring how to help grow that and kind of build a broader kind of global space community. Mm -hmm. And uh, one question we, we had while we were uh, preparing for this is um, space, and definitely the, we heard today a lot of space today. Now, space in Africa. Why space in Africa? So there are a few reasons. I mean, Africa has played you know, a long history in, in the space sector. Um, going back to the mid-50s, for example, South Africa was part of the deep space network for NASA, um, providing telemetry to a lot of the interplanetary missions. Um, the Italians had uh, established the Louis Broglio Space Center off Kenya, providing tracking and telemetry for um, ESA missions out of Karoo. So there's a, there's a really long history of Africa playing a role. Um, not just sort of in the past, but if you look now, there's um, kind of very large astronomy projects such as the Square Kilometer Array, which is a massive 3,000 dish deep space astronomy program that's been kind of hosted out of South Africa, but extends all the way up into, into Central Africa. So given a combination of geographic um, advantages, right, being able to launch on a coastal east coast location such as Kenya is really great for launch, it's equatorial. Um, there are just many great advantages. You combine that with um, a young, kind of highly skilled technical population that's digitally native, it's really establishing uh, a good future for this kind of, kind of industry. Mm -hmm. That's uh, su super interesting. Um, maybe also if we compare that um, also what, what you're doing in Africa to maybe the European part, um, we as Unio Enterprise are, are playing, um, we're building a European satellite constellation. Um, was founded by ESA Aerospace, Reflex Aerospace, Mineric and uh, SES. Um, you could think about, humbly I would say, like the European Starlink. Um, and I think we saw now not only kicked off by, 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 the, by the war uh, in Ukraine, um, that Europe is actually looking for their own sovereignty in terms of communication and secure government um, operations. Now, how do you think about this one? Does Europe need its own satellite constellation for sovereignty, or do you see any more use cases there? Yeah, I think that the idea of sovereignty um, for space is really important. You know, I think you know, the, the theme for this conference is around beyond now. And space is, is a new geography, right? It's a new location that we're able to work within. And I think that, you know, in, in our histories, whenever we have moved into a new geography, um, whether that's Europeans moving into the Americas, um, you know, China exploring into Africa, you know, hundreds of years ago, these shifts into new, um, new worlds create fundamental changes back in their home countries. And I think this idea of understanding what that means, um, understanding what does that mean for sovereignty, are critical questions that we haven't yet figured out. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think as, as space as a, as a new frontier, right? I mean, this planet here is exploited. Mm -hmm. I think everybody knows what we have done uh, with this world here. Um, now we're looking into space as a new frontier. We are. We have plans on mining asteroids because we don't have any resources um, anymore. Um, we're looking into space manufacturing. Uh, Spaceforge is such a company, a uh, startup that is, that is doing it now. Now, do you think that with the same system we have in place here, space would be the next one we could exploit in a, in a human way? I'd, I'd be very worried that if we take the same kind of decision making that we have established here on Earth over the last 30, 40, 50 years, and we replicate that in the space environment, we are going to cause all sorts of new problems for ourselves, and problems that we don't even understand yet. Um, and I think that those exist not just um, off-planet, but will also end up 
um, causing problems back here. So we've seen you know, some really amazing applications of space technologies in terms of disaster management, in terms of um, planning. Um, but if we, and this comes back to the question of sovereignty, if we maintain the kind of technical borders that have been established you know, in the past, we're going to replicate those problems. And that will lead to all sorts of challenges in terms of um, giving people the best information to fight climate change, mm -hmm. um, solving issues such as migration. Um, and these are problems that are not just African or just European. They are, they are joint problems. Like the issues of migration are because of the situation that we're facing in part because of climate change in Africa. So I think we need to be um, utilizing this new geography in a way that is um, a lot more collaborative, um, and that provides us access to better decisions um, that you know, help move the needle forward. And do you believe that, uh, that the policy, policy makers, I mean, that can influence these kind of, they need to influence, right? Because it's a capital intensive business. Um, putting a satellite up there is just not, not cheap. It's sure. cheaper than we, than we had the last years. But do you see that the policymakers are are making the right actions yeah. either in Europe or in South Africa or sure. the US? So, so there's been some really interesting, I think, developments over the last couple of years. And this was a little bit kind of maybe driven in the US where there was an increasing privatization of the space sector. And that's certainly the whole topic of new space. Um, I read earlier this week that um, there's a kind of a call for ESA to also start having a much stronger um, privatization drive written by the guys at Seraphim Space um, Capital. So one of the really interesting things that we find, particularly in, in Africa, um, when we look at the, at the space sector, is Africa does not have the same infrastructure or incumbent industries that you might find in Europe or the US. We don't have an Airbus or a Boeing or you know, Lockheed. We don't have these firms which means that we are able to operate from a kind of blank slate around what does the industry look like. So we don't need to take the same pathway of establishing industries that are hundreds of billions of dollars, but can rather create much smaller, much more agile new space industries that are driven primarily through private capital yeah. as opposed to large public capital. Yeah, well, I would say, I mean, not necessarily you need those Airbus and uh, the big no. companies, right? I mean, the, the big incumbents, we just see, I mean, we saw it, we saw it last year or, or this year. I mean, ESA Aerospace started from, from Munich as the fastest growing European new space company. Reflex Aerospace raised a huge round. Yeah. Um, we're doing Unio. Um, SpaceX um, is probably the most prominent um, example yeah. in it. Um, but still, and I think there's, that's, that's what's changing, is that we do need to work together, right? As yep. startups with the big incumbents, because Absolutely. it's like very complicated. And we will say, we're, we're good on doing things fast. We're, we're good on, on, on commercializing mm. space, right? Because we always come from, from, from the commercial side, from the automakers, autonomous mm. driving, communication. Um, but still um, creating something in aerospace and getting that certified um, is certainly something, something distant. So despite those hurdles on getting something certified, um, do you see still that there's a huge market for startups in space? Yeah, I, I think that um, in, in the same way that, um, uh, that you saw uh, this kind of move towards mobile technologies or mobile banking in Africa, where you're not burdened by legacy infrastructure, you're able to move very, very quickly and solve a lot of problems. And so I think that when we look at the opportunities presented by space-based technologies and, and, and space-based platforms to solve issues um, on the ground, there are many, many problems that in the past would have been solved in a very expensive way that was simply not solved because it was too expensive. But now with the advent of these new technologies, um, there's a much bigger market that is being opened up precisely because these price points are significantly different. And it's not, it's not that we we um, don't need, as you say, the bigger incumbents. Like, it's critical that we have um, a bigger ecosystem, but it's about taking a different development path towards achieving this kind of access to space. Um, and not just access to space, but like, what does that provide in terms of 
your ability to solve problems back on Earth, which is you know, primarily still the main reason why we are, are doing so much of this. Mm -hmm. And do you believe in the, I mean, we saw, we saw the billionaires going to space um, last year, so what part, of, what part of those business models or use mm -hmm. cases do you think is, I mean, is space tourism viable? Well, it's certainly viable, but is, yeah. it, is, it, is it economically viable? Or what other use cases do you see? You know, I think economy? that I think for you know one of the first space tourists that went up was a South African entrepreneur, uh, Mark Shuttleworth. You know, some some twenty odd years ago. Um, so I think that there is always going to be a small market for that. But I think that where some of the more interesting applications um, exist um, are the creation of novel um, materials and molecules that cannot be produced on Earth. Right. So when we're able to um, do zero gravity manufacturing. What does that mean for biochemistry? What does it mean for precision manufacturing of medical devices or you know, a whole range of other highly specialized materials? Those are things that we cannot do here because everything on Earth is subject to gravity. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I think that there are going to be some incredibly interesting applications for a whole new class of materials that we haven't really explored yet, but that will be incredibly valuable, almost certainly, in solving problems back on Earth. Correct. And, um, and I think that's a, a way to think about it, because everybody actually here in the room or, or here should care about the space economy, because we're actually using it, right? Everybody got the new iOS update. In an emergency, you could contact the satellite and get some, uh, some help if you, if you need it. Um, but I think sometimes when you, when you don't realize how much we're actually using and um, humanity has been very dependent on, on communication, on bandwidth. And if you connect all the machines, if you connect everything that we want to connect, it's just not going to be enough for, uh, for the telco industry, for example, yeah. to supply it. Um, so we're actually talking with some telcos to build a, a backbone um, in space with satellite constellations. And here again, telco business will always be there, right? It will always survive and it's, and, and it's useful. Um, but many communication still goes undersea, right? So we have, still have undersea water cables, and I think, I don't know, a very high number of communication from the Europe to the US goes uh, undersea, and uh, we had some, some, uh, some projects with telcos to build that backbone um, to be, to be uh, invincible, actually, yeah. on communication. I mean, something that I'd be curious about from your perspective is, you know, talking about this, this, um, this backbone, I think the, having continuity of connection is incredibly important. Yeah. And a secure continuity of connection. Um, and in your experience, like, how is that being, being developed? Yeah. Like, if you want to have autonomous vehicles or you want to have drones doing delivery across, like, large expanses, yeah. how, do you, how do you achieve that, that persistence? Well, that's seamless uh, communication, right? That's we're going to the satellite constellation business, what we do have at Unio, we're raising. Um, but um, that's exactly the use case, right? And us Munich people, uh, to give you an example, real life example, what we love to do is to go on, on holidays to Austria. Now there's this one critical moment when you cross the border and you lose connectivity 10 minutes when crossing the border because it goes from one tower to another. Now imagine being in an autonomous driving car at that moment, right? It's a very, very dangerous place to be if you lose connectivity. That's why we call it seamless connectivity, uh, to have that constellations on there. And then we go into use cases on, well, if, it's actually on if autonomous driving will come, what will you be doing in your car um, if you're not constantly paying attention to the, to the road? Um, you're gonna have entertainment, you're gonna work, you're gonna, you're gonna just have some, some very other applications. Um, or railways, right? Deutsche Bahn, who loves, who loves Wi-Fi and Deutsche Bahn? Um, that's also one case where we say this is where we could have the connectivity from space um, and uh, the bandwidths are possible, right? And the speed is possible. Um, but I believe it just needs to be commercially driven and not governmental yeah. driven. Yeah, I think you know, one of the, the great applications that, that we're seeing a lot is around, kind of call it local connectivity. So how do you create local hotspots in a rural community? It doesn't necessarily, um, you know, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have full access to the internet, but as like a stepping stone towards development, having local systems that are connected through a particular um, communication point, which would be like satellite communicated. Yeah, right. Um, and 
the, the huge advantage of this is that you no longer have to build significant telecommunication infrastructure through very complicated terrain to allow people to have this kind of access to, to data. Yeah. Um, and once you start creating that, you really enable, um, you know, in, in the olden days, it was around how close are you to a waterway um, or to a road in order to have economic activity. And I think one of the new questions is how close are you to the internet in order to have that same economic activity? And this is, I think, one of the big shifts we need to explore. It's something to think about, yeah. And I think to, to close this, maybe to close with a, with a quote of the astronaut taking the picture. Oh, so one of the things that kind of always struck me, you know, when we think about space is not um, the kind of famous, you know, uh, small blue marble, um, but rather an image that one of the astronauts took where it is him and a camera and everyone else. And in that moment, he was just struck by how isolated he was, you know, that on the other side of this camera was every single person that ever had or did exist in that moment. And I think this idea of, of that fragility has always struck with me. So yeah. only one planet. Exactly. Absolutely. Many thanks, Davis. Thank you.